record. Um, we are going to be recording um, this information session because some parents have uh, who can't make it this evening have asked that um, we record so that they can uh, they can watch it. So we will be doing that. And uh, we ask that you turn off all of your microphones, please, and cameras, just so that we can have a bit of better um, a better um, connection. And um, just letting some more people in here. And uh, and also, if you have any questions, please feel free to add them in the chat. We will definitely leave some time in the end of our session for some Q&A, uh, because we know that you uh, probably will have lots of questions, and we think it's important to make sure that we get to them. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, it is my pleasure. So my name is Christine Zagiki, and I'm the head of the guidance department at Earl Haig. I see many familiar names here um, in our in our uh, guest list, and it is my pleasure this evening to introduce a former graduate student of ours, uh, Sophie Matson. She uh, graduated from Earl Haig from the Claude Watson Drama Program last year. And she is currently a McMaster student studying life sciences. And I'm sure that's an incredibly interesting topic for many of our students because that is a very popular destination. So I'm sure they're all waiting to see, Sophie, what you have to say. Um, and I wanted to just thank Sophie right off the bat because she reached out to us volunteering um, to, to do this uh, information session because she knows that this is a time of really high stress for a lot of our graduates. And there's a lot of questions and a lot of curiosity and excitement and anxiety. And so uh, this is really great, Sophie, that you're doing this for us. And uh, without any further delay, I'm going to uh, get you to start your presentation. I'm gonna turn my camera off. Again, if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will get to them by the end of the evening. Thank you so much. Sophie, take it away. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, Ms. Sagikian, I actually just wanted to make sure um, that you're not seeing my speaker notes. <laughs> or do you see them? No, I don't see them. Okay, amazing. Okay, then I'm sharing yeah. the correct screen. All right. <laughs> you're okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Ms. Sagikian and the guidance department for having me. Um, today, I will be talking to you about the do's and the don'ts of university, and these are all things that I have sort of learned from my personal experience as I navigated my journey from the transition to uh, from high school to now being in first year university. Um, so one thing that I would sort of like to start off with is uh, a disclaimer and I want to say that everybody's university experience is going to be entirely different. Um, you know, you may have a different university experience compared to your friends, and some people may love it, some people may not love it as much. Um, but my advice that I'm going to be giving to you today is meant to be sort of like tools in your university toolbox that you can, you know, pull out if you're ever feeling stuck or if you're ever feeling, feeling a little bit lost or you kind of don't know what to do at first. Um, but I do advise everybody to, you know, have your own experience and learn for yourself first and then use my information afterwards. Um, so a little bit about me, as Ms. Sagikian said, is that I graduated um, in the Earl Hay class of 2022, just last year, so I'm still a baby when it comes to university. Um, I was a drama major, um, and I now currently study life sciences at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm going into my second year. Um, at McMaster, we specialize after first year, so I still don't know um, the results of that, but I'm excited to find out. So. Uh, we are going to start with discussing the transition from high school to university, and I'm going to kind of use my own experience as an example. I didn't have, I had quite a unique experience when it came to the transition, so I will, I will get into that. Um, first off, um, my applications. So I applied to a total of four universities and in six programs. 
I applied to the University of Toronto Scarborough, uh, Trent University, McMaster University, and Queen's University. Um, I applied into the Life Sciences program at University of Toronto, um, the Biomedical Science in the Medical Professional Stream, that's a lot to say, um, at Trent, uh, Life Sciences Gateway at McMaster, and then Honours Life Science and Biochemistry at Queen's, as well as Health Sciences at both Queen's and McMaster. And this is the timeline that I was accepted into each of these universities, and then I was rejected from uh, the health science programs, which actually turned out to be a blessing in disguise, but I will get to more about that in a bit. So leading up to my decision, I was dead set on going to Trent University in the biomedical program. Um, I had already paid the housing deposit. I was for weeks ready to go to Trent. Um, but there was still something holding me back. I guess it was kind of just the you know, the ultimate decision of uh, choosing the university. Um, I actually had never visited McMaster in the fall, so I, I didn't really know entirely what the campus looked like. Um, but I wanted to apply because it was a good university. Also, my dad went to the McMaster, so I'd heard good things. Um, and I found out that the McMaster open house may at Mac was coming up on May 14th, 2022, which to mention was two weeks away from the deadline where you're supposed to accept your university. And I didn't really want to go because I was thinking, I'm going to Trent, it's fine. And my mom was saying to me, no, you should go. I went and boy, was I conflicted afterwards. This photo accurately represents my brain. Um, and how I was feeling. I completely fell in love with the campus. I really didn't know what to do anymore. Um, I loved the program, I loved the campus, and I completely felt at home um, at McMaster, more so than I did at Trent. And so I had a pretty hard decision to make at that point. And so I was sharing all these like my conflictedness with my friends. And these were accurate things, like verbatim of what people were telling me um, when I was coming to them with my, my sort of dilemma of what, I, what university I should pick. Um, and ev everyone was telling me different things about what I should do. And so what I learned from this is actually pretty valuable and was that you should make the decision that's best for you. If you're still in the same boat and like how I was in, really, you know, make the decision that was that is best for you, not what your parents want you to do or what your friends want you to do, um, but what you really want. Um, this year, I was fortunate enough to be a science ambassador for the university, for the Faculty of Science. And so I would help out with all of the open houses. If you've been to one of the open houses, you may have seen me. Um, but I would see so many students that were kind of just being dragged by their parents to, you know, check out these programs that they weren't even interested in, or talking about masters and PhD programs that they were never even interested in. And I felt sorry for them. Um, but that's why I really, really, really want to emphasize that if you're still making your decision to really make the decision that's best for you. And so on May 28th, four days before the decision deadline, I accepted McMaster on OUAC. This is an actual photo of me <laughs> when I accepted and I got all my McMaster merch and stuff. Um, so yeah, it was a relief to actually make a decision but long story short i actually had no idea where i wanted to go and that is totally okay if you're still in this situation i know the deadline is nearing but that is totally fine you still have a couple days to decide but also if you chose early like if you got your acceptance right away and you accepted that's amazing too that means that you can sort of enjoy your last stretch of high school because i know that's coming to an end soon i'm sorry to bring it up but um you can also start applying to scholarships financial aid um and then you can also start the sort of emotional transition sooner so now 
it's summer. Congratulations. I'm giving you premature congratulations for finishing high school <laughs> and your exams. Um, so summer is a really, really crucial time um, in terms of uh, university deadlines. So this is sort of the table contents of what I'm going to be talking about. So make sure you stay up to date with your university's important, um, important deadlines. Um, because most of the course selection and residence selections will be happening end of June, beginning of July. And so I will speak more about the course selection and housing selection in the next few slides. But another big thing that you need to do in the summer is take a break because you've just closed one chapter of your life and you're about to, you know, start another one. And I think that kind of deserves a break. So make sure you hang out with friends, go on vacation if you're able to, and, you know, don't focus on school for a little while. Another thing is, um, if you're kind of an anxious person like I am, maybe choose to sort of mentally prepare yourself for, you know, the university experience that's coming. I remember I took like the whole summer to sort of mentally prepare myself. I was very nervous about this big change. I am an only child and I have not been away from home for more than a week ever. So this was a huge thing for me moving away from home. So also take this time for yourself and to get ready for things that are coming. So for selection, usually will happen mid-June to July. Um, this is an actual photo of my course timetable for my first semester. Um, it's one of the many examples. Um, so make sure that you check beforehand with your university the required courses that you need to take. For example, for me as a science major, I had to take a chemistry and a biology course. Um, so make sure you double check with engineering. It could be different for an art student. It could also be different. Um, universities, uh, are also different here at McMaster as a life sciences student. I was able to pick my times, um, for my, uh, required courses as well as my electives. Um, the engineering students here had their timetable given to them. They didn't have a choice. Um, at some universities, like at TMU, I know that their required courses are given to them, but their electives they can choose. So really make sure to check with your university specifically on what you are able to do. And my biggest advice for this is to have a game plan. Make sure that you look at electives beforehand. Find something that you like something that is fun, but that could also be useful towards your degree or pick something that is entirely different from what you're studying. Um, courses fill up fast, especially if they're popular. So having an idea of what you want beforehand will really help ensure that you get your spot. Um, make sure that you kind of figure out what time of day you study best. For example, I thought that I was a morning person. And so I picked all my days to start at 8.30, end at two o'clock so that I could be done and have the rest of the day to sort of relax, study. And then I found out that I was a night person and that 8.30s were absolutely brutal. So make sure you kind of figure out, um, even now, since exams are coming up as well, figure out what times you study best. And then, with your electives, you should really try new things as well. Like, for example, my first semester, I decided to take an anthrop anthropology class because a friend of mine advised that I should take something completely out of my major so that it's not science focused all the time. And my anthropology class turned out to be my favorite class of first semester. And so much so that I'm actually most likely going to minor in anthropology. <laughs> um, so I'd take a leap, you may find something that you like. Um, and then with residence selection, this also happens uh, around June to July, and it is again highly dependent on the university. 
Um, this is a picture of my residence that I stayed in this year at McMaster. That arrow is actually pointing to my window, um, that I, my room that I stayed in. Um, so this is again, highly dependent on the university. McMaster has a lottery system um, in terms of when you can pick your residence. So those who had an earlier time slot kind of got their pick of the bunch, whereas people with later time slots kind of just had what was left. So, and that's something that we couldn't control, but it could also be different for other universities where you can just have your pick and that's that. Um, when picking um, your residence, depending on whether you sort of like to be alone, like you, you, you're, you prefer living alone, or if you're more of a social person and you want to live with a roommate, most universities will have very different um, residence styles. Like at McMaster, we had singles, we had doubles, um, we had apartment style residences. We also had residences where there was like four people to a room, all girls residences. So try and think of beforehand when you're picking a residence because those also fill up fast um, to kind of have an idea of what you want to do. If you're going to university with a friend, maybe consider being roommates. Um, my best friend and I went to university. We're both at Mac, same program, but we opted to not live together because we were a little bit worried that we might kind of hate each other from being around each other so much, which was the best decision for us. But I know other people that went to university with their best friends and they live together and they're still as close as they were when they came in. Um, if you have a roommate that you don't know, maybe take the summer to get to know each other and to reach out, message each other if you both live in Ontario to maybe hang out sometime. Um, because sort of knowing who you live with beforehand can really prevent any unexpected surprises, um, as well as already having, you already have a connection, um, a friend that you're at university with. So now the time has come. Welcome to your new chapter. Welcome to university. Um, I am going to be talking about welcome week, the social aspects, the academic and the financial, and then I'm going to finish it off with a day in the life of a university student. This is going to be the biggest section, so bear with me. Um, We're going to start off with welcome week which most universities, if not all universities, will have a welcome week. Um, to put it in more, you know, relatable terms, it's like carp day on steroids, but for multiple days. Um, there's usually concerts, faculty events, games, you know, off-campus hikes. These are some things that I had, movie nights and residence events. Um, some things that were specific to my welcome week was, um, I don't know if any of you are on TikTok and you know Spencer West, he's a disability advocate. He came and gave a talk about asking for help. Um, we had a BB No Money concert, which is actually this photo in the middle. That's him right there. Um, we, I went on a Hamilton waterfall hike. Hamilton is quite well known for its beautiful waterfalls. Um, we had a faculty fest where we got to meet all of the other faculties. We had a silent disco um, and lots of, you know, other events where you could just meet new people. And it was it was one of the top highlights of my university experience so far. Um, as well as it being fun, it's also a good time to use strategically. Um, so use this time to, you know, get to know your campus, um, find out where your classes are. It's like what you do on the first day of high school, like of a new year where you want to go find your door number to see where your class is. You do the same here, except it's in multiple buildings. So make sure you know where you're going. Um, make friends here. Some of the people that I've met at Welcome Week are still my closest friends and uh, will probably be for the rest of my university career. Um, so take it as a time to make friends, network, um, talk to upper years, because most likely they will be volunteering to 
make sure the welcome week runs smoothly. So talk to them, ask them for advice, ask them what they did, what their experience was. Find the good food spots. <laughs> I can't emphasize this enough. It's being in your first week of university is stressful enough as it is. It can't be more stressful when you're trying to find food and where to eat. So try and find some good food beforehand. Um, now moving on to the social aspects. Um, this is a picture with me and my very, very close friend group. Um, four people in this photo actually went to Hague. There's a lot of Hague people that go to McMaster and somehow we all found each other and made a friend group. It was great. Um, so having a group of friends is absolutely vital. Um, it, university can be a very exciting time, but it can also be a very lonely time if all that you do is study. This is something that I did in my first semester, which was I just shut myself in my room and studied all day and I barely went out except to go to class. And that really took a toll on, you know, my mental health, but also me academically. Whereas in second semester, I made an effort to, you know, go out, study at the library, hang out with my friends, go to the gym, that sort of thing. And not only did my mental health improve, but my grades did improve significantly. So having a good support system really makes or breaks a university experience. Another thing is talk to your professors. You're going to hear this from anybody that you ask. Introduce yourself. I tell everybody, go up to them and go, hi, my name is. It will really make you stand out. The professor will know who you are. Ask them about their research. They want to talk about it all day long. Ask them about what they do. Maybe see if you're interested in you know, helping them out with research. This is especially a huge thing for any STEM students you know, connect with them, and then you might be able to do research with them in upper years. Um, another piece of advice that I would give is make a new friend in every class that you have. Talk to the people in front, to the side, behind you. It's always really helpful to have at least someone that you know in a class so that you can, you know, share notes, that you can study together for that class. If you miss the day, then you can, you know, get notes from them and you can get them to explain concepts to you. Have a good work-life balance. This is something that I'm still working on myself, um, but have fun on and off campus. You know, studying is not everything that you're meant to do in university. It is a big part of it. So that's why trying to have that balance will really, you know, prevent burnout because burnout is absolutely real and it is terrible so take some time for yourself each day to you know go for a walk go to the gym do something that you really enjoy my final point is to really get involved like join a club join a council join i don't know a horse riding team if that's something that you're into um my first year i i made the mistake of you know, not joining a council. Um, I, okay, I wanted to sort of scope out what the university experience was like first. And then by the time that I thought I was ready to join a council, all the applications were closed and I couldn't get into anything. I fortunately signed up to be a science ambassador in the summer, and then I did something that was totally out of my comfort zone, which was join a dance team. So, you know, do things that are fun, that are sort of out of your comfort zone, but also make sure that if joining a club or a council is something that you really want to do, make sure you keep up to date with your deadlines. Because um, then you can make more friends and it'll help you network and get your name out there even more. So now I will be talking about the academic aspects. So these are where most of my advice will come from. And this is all advice that I learned sort of the hard way. Um, first off, read your syllabus and make a schedule before classes start. So this will be during welcome week. They will usually post the syllabus if not beforehand. So a syllabus, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a giant course outline 
um, of all the professor information, your TA information, heavily important dates, usually what you'll be learning, um, stuff about, you know, if you missed a, if you missed a, a midterm or a test or something like that. It is like a gold mine of information. So make sure you read it thoroughly. And in the syllabus, it'll have a lot of important dates in it. So make sure you take out all the important dates and try and put it in a schedule, put it in a calendar. I use Notion. It's um, like a scheduling software, um, but I have friends that use Google Sheets, some people that just have like a physical like agenda that they write in, um, whatever works. But this was a huge lifesaver for me um, to you know make sure that I was always prepared and knew what was coming up. Um, start studying and reviewing right away. This, um, especially for STEM students, is a big thing. Um, I remember in the first week even, so many people were saying that they felt already like behind in university, which is probably not true because we had barely learned anything so far, but it's important to sort of get that rhythm going of starting to review what you learned in the past week, start studying because quizzes and tests are going to be coming up very quickly. Um, and this will help you prevent already, you know, cramming for the following week and feel less uh, overwhelmed. Uh, first year is also a time to experiment with many different study methods. Um, it's actually, I know your exams are coming up, so you could even do this now. Um, I would actually take this information and apply it now so that um, you don't have to experiment with first year and then you can kind of just get into it already. I did not have an exam since grade nine. So having your first big exam since high school be a university one is not fun. So experiment now with different study methods. Um, your study habits are going to change from high school to university. Like uh, memorization does not cut it anymore. You really have to study to understand. Um, I again, learned this the hard way. <laughs> um, I, try to use the Pomodoro method, which is studying for 25 minutes on and then take a five minute break and then alternate. Um, I also use the Feynman technique, which is teaching it to others. Um, you should also see if you study better alone versus with your friends. I am, I am really trying hard to work on this, but I study better alone. Um, while all my friends go and study together. I'm trying, I'm working on it. Um, but as of right now, studying alone is just my personal preference. Also seeing where you study best. Um, a big piece of advice that I received from an upper year is study as far away from your bed as possible because otherwise you will be way too tempted to fall asleep, especially when you're sleep deprived. So go to the library, go to, I don't know, your student center, go sit in your kitchen and study, just experiment and sort of shuffle them so that you're, you can kind of keep your brain active. Another sort of big thing when it comes to studying is take breaks. I cannot emphasize this enough. Burnout is very real. And I'm sure as grade 12 students, you will know this. At some point throughout your high school career, you felt it. Um, taking breaks not only, you know, prevents burnout, but it also prevents the procrastination that follows burnout. And it just like prolongs the amount of time that you're away studying. So make sure taking breaks, try and get off screens, you know, go outside, go for a walk, read a book, something like that. Meditate if that's what you're into. But taking breaks is a really, really big thing that you need to do. Another thing is ask for help. This one I also cannot emphasize enough, asking for help, whether it be academically or if you're having some personal issues, go ask for help. It's not a sign of weakness, it is a sign of strength. So 
If you don't understand something that was taught in a lecture, go ask your professor in office hours, or sometimes they'll stay after a lecture and you can go ask them then. Um, if you're not understanding a concept, ask your friends to help you. There is no such thing as a stupid question. It may seem like it, but it really isn't. And just, just, just ask. <laughs> this is something that every university student has a fear of. Just ask. It's not gonna, it, it's not gonna kill you just to ask a question. And I promise the professors will not be judging you. If there is a sort of a personal issue that you're having, you can, you know, talk to your friends. Um, but also a lot of universities will have um, school psychologists that are available. There's also uh, like at McMaster, we have a wellness center where we can speak to, you know, people that are meant to handle personal situations, whether it be a psychologist or like a guidance counselor equivalent. Um, but just if you're having a difficult time, really go talk to somebody. And this is another big point for your exams coming up. Um, prepare far in advance for midterms and exams. And my like sweet spot is at least two weeks um, because as someone with test anxiety, that's, that's me, preparing earlier makes me feel calmer and more ready on test day. You will also remember more um, creating a schedule also really helps to sort of break down your studying into chunks and it makes it feel more doable and you'll get more covered in less amount of time. Um, oh, this is another big one. Don't compare yourself to others. I really, really struggled with this in first year. Um, at McMaster as a life science student, you come in being one of a thousand students in the gateway. And these are people from all different types of academic backgrounds, whether it be from you know, a different country, taking IB, taking AP, um, some people who hadn't learned material that I had learned in high school everybody comes from a different background and so it can be really it it can be really difficult to you know see people that are excelling so much further than you um even though they don't they if they might have already learned it i also had struggles comparing myself to my own friends my own friend group where some of them are a lot better at chemistry than i am and so I would really find it agonizing to study with them just because I would see that they're so much farther ahead than I was in, in our learning. And so something that I still remind myself to this day is just stay in your own lane um, that you're doing just fine. You're where you're meant to be. And that also I try and tell myself that, you know, your time is coming. It's you're going to get there and just to keep pushing on. So if you ever find yourself in this situation, just try and focus in on yourself. And if you're not understanding something, maybe ask your friend for help. And that's something that I had a friend tell me was just to get over myself and start asking people for help rather than trying to avoid them. Still working on it. And then finally for the academic is grades do not define you. This is Every university student will have challenges with grades. Your sort of grade standards will change significantly from high school. Um, like I remember I had friends that were super happy with a 70, whereas when they were in high school, they were like straight A student, top of their class. It will really change. And this is all coming with the learning proce process. Um, just know that you can come back from bad grades or, you know, a bad test, a bad semester. Also take the time to, you know, learn from your mistakes. Um, keep making them because that is how you learn. Just push forward. Um, and ultimately just be kind to your mind. It's supporting you. Just be kind. Uh, next, we will talk about the financial aspects. So 
apply for scholarships and bursaries, no matter how big or small, you know, oop. what was that? Sorry. Um, you know, a, a $50 scholarship is way better than, you know, nothing. So apply for as many as you can. Um, you can apply through OSAP. You can also apply through third parties like the Student Life Network or Yconic. I know those, I applied with those. Um, depending on your grades, you may also get entrance scholarships. So make sure that you keep up your conditionals. Um, universities also have funds set aside, dedicated towards um, scholarships and bursaries. So for example, McMaster has a program called Award Spring where you basically just put in all of your financial information and then you'll automatically get entered into scholarships. Um, not all universities have this, so make sure you check with your university. Um, there's also a lot of part-time jobs, job options on campus. I have a couple friends that work in the cafeteria. I also have one that works in our campus store. So there are definitely many opportunities. Another thing is meal plans. And this is usually something that you get when you're living in residence. Um, so at McMaster, we have our student cards and basically we just scan our student card and that can pay for our meals. Um, and we have what's called the varsity plan, which is for the athletes. We have the regular plan and then a light plan. So I got a regular plan, but I probably should have gotten a light one because I ended up cooking for myself a lot. So try and think of what you're going to be end up doing. If you like to cook, you might want to get a lighter version of a meal plan if that's an option. Um, and meal plans, I believe, usually at McMaster is around $2,000 for a regular one. It may differ again. So just make sure that you, you check with your university. And then finally, I will sort of take you through a day in the life of my, this was from my second semester. Um, so normally I would get up at eight and I would get ready to go to class uh, from nine to two. Um, I'm, I may have breakfast, I may have not, may not, depending on if I have a lab or not, because they usually those are, I, those require my attention more. Um, afterwards, I will get lunch and then I will usually go to the library, take a small break, whether it be, you know, reading a book, watching my TV shows, something like that. And then I will study for the rest of the afternoon and then usually get dinner around seven um, and have dinner for around an hour. And then I, in my second semester, really started going to the gym. So I would go to the gym for about an hour and a half. And I usually go with my friends. This is the gym was sort of our bonding time, our de-stress time. And then I would go back to my dorm, um, finish up any assignments or any work that I had to do. And then I would end up going to bed at around 1130, give or take, sometimes bordering 2 a.m university life, I guess. So yeah. Um, so some final points that I would like to leave you with um, is go where it feels best for you, not what your friends or what your parents want to do. Um, and that maybe if you don't get into your dream program, it may turn out to be a blessing in disguise. Like I said, I ended up loving science, learning about science way more than I would have been uh, loving being in a health side program. Make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. It is the best way to learn. Um, make friends, take breaks, and ultimately have the best time because university is supposed to be some of the greatest years of your life. So good luck. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, if you have any further questions after this presentation and after the Q&A, uh, this is where you can reach me. So feel free to take some, take a picture, screenshot. Um, it's my Instagram, my student email. I don't know how LinkedIn works. So that's my name on LinkedIn. Um, you can uh, put it in and we can connect that sort of thing. 
Um, so yeah, now I can answer any questions that you may have. Um, again, no stupid questions. Ask any and as many as you want. Um, and it can be literally about anything related to the university experience or high school. I'm still pretty much fresh out of high school, so I can answer any questions. Hi, Sophie. Hi. When it comes to taking a break, um, are vacations acceptable? So, for example, like oh, for a one day vacation, something like that. One or day, two days, one or two days of your vacation. Um, during university? Yeah, university. Okay. Um, honestly, it depends. Uh, if it was a one to two day vacation, I might suggest doing that on the weekends. Um, because it honestly, it depends on the course load as well as how busy you would be um, if you join any clubs or anything. Um, during the week, taking, taking breaks, I would say maybe an afternoon, that sort of thing, or taking, you know, maybe a couple hours to yourself. But if you want to take one to two day vacations, I would most likely say do those on the weekends. But again, it's entirely up to the schedule um that you would have or maybe um i think 30 minutes exercise like every day is that helpful oh yes oh yes 30 minutes even an hour exercise is a really great way to you know de-stress and to take your mind off it um yeah i i entirely emphasize getting a, le a, a bit of exercise every day for sure Sophie, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so the first one was uh, where you got your scholarships again, if you can repeat those. Scholarships, I can show you. Um, so um, one scholarship um, program that I used was the Student Life Network. Um, I entered in a contest called Canada's Luckiest Student, which I think the grand prize is like $50,000 or something like that. Um, there's also Yconic. Um, I can type it in the chat. Um, it's that. Um, but also several, you know, organizations, I literally the way that I started trying to find scholarships was just googling student scholarships, high school student scholarships, university student scholarships, that sort of thing. And I would find all these organizations that will um, put postings up for scholarships and some of them. Um, there are definitely requirements and eligibilities, but again, it really try and um, apply to as many as you can. There's also uh, certain companies that, you know, um, if you have a parent or if you are the parent, some companies will actually provide scholarships as well. I, my mom works for BMO, the Bank of Montreal, and they provide scholarships for high school students. So definitely check through your work if there are any scholarships available. Okay, we have another question in the chat. If you were to get sick, how would you recover from all the missed work? Ooh, sick. Okay. Definitely reach out to professors um, or uh, course coordinators. That's also a big thing. Your professor might not be able to do as much, but your course coordinator can. If you miss big assessments, uh, like a midterm or an exam, I don't, I'm pretty sure this is the same for all universities, but we have uh, in university, you have something called an MSAF. I don't know what the long form of it is, but it's basically a form that you fill out saying the reason why you missed um, the evaluation. And sort of if you're, if it gets approved, then you uh, might be able to have your exam deferred to a later time. Um, there's also, um, I know that there's the student accessibility services at McMaster where you can sort of go to them if you have an issue and they can try and help sort it out. If it's if it's something like a cold or like the flu, um, my best advice would be just to try and 
do as much work as you can that your body allows you to definitely take more breaks um, than you normally would. Um, but just reach out to course coordinators, reach out to professors, to TAs, just to let them know what's going on. Um, and then just try and get better as soon as possible. I will add that uh, at the university level or even college level, doctors uh, documentation is needed. So doctor's notes, uh, lawyer's notes, what, whatever the appointment is regarding. Uh, and even, you know, I hope it doesn't happen, but it, but in the case of a, of a death or something like that, a funeral, they do, believe it or not, require to see a death certificate. So um, they will not just take your word for it. You do have to provide documentation. So please be aware uh, that you're not in high school anymore. And, and it's not that they don't care, but there are so many students. They need to have a, um, a rigid process and policy in place. Uh, what uh, I was going to mention this in the end, just echo what Sophie was saying, but I think this is a good segue to it. Uh, so, and I have mentioned this as well to many students, but I think that uh, if you're used to going to the guidance department and asking for help and talking to your guidance counselor, um, maybe even going in once in a while and just having a talk session or something like that, I highly, highly recommend for actually for all students to find out before classes start where where the resources that you're going to need are, are at. So um, where is the student services department, um, financial aid, so that in the case that you do need help, let's say you're in a crisis and you need to go and speak to somebody, you don't want to be figuring out um, in the middle of a crisis who you talk to, what the process is, how you make an appointment. You want to know exactly who you're going to see and how you're going to do it. So I highly recommend that before classes start and you get distracted with your work and studying, you figure all of this out. out. Um, you find out who your go-to people are, and that way um, you're prepared if and when you need to access these resources. For sure. For yeah. Sure. We have um, another question on the chat. Sophie, since you're studying life sciences, I was wondering if you happen to know what the chances of getting into an American medical school is if one goes to McMaster Life Sciences, how easy is it? I don't know if Sophie's gonna know, but. Um, I can speak about medical school in general. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, <clears throat> sorry, about American medical schools. Um, this was a question that I got a lot when I was doing open houses. Um, you can get into medical school <clears throat> with any degree. It can like you can even like an arts degree, you can get into medical school. Um, and this is something that a lot of people find, um, you know, not getting into health side. They think, oh, I can't get into medical school, but like you can you can get into medical school with a life sciences degree. It, it's it's not just the degree. It's also your MCAT score. It's also you know your extracurriculars that you do. Um, so I don't I don't entirely know the process of American medical schools, but I would assume it's similar to Canadian medical schools. Um, but a lot of what you learn in the McMaster Life Sci program but you also will be specializing in second year. So you can pick a specialty that will sort of tailor you towards what you will learn on the MCAT. And for most science students, um, what will be on the MCAT, they will have be finished learning by the end of second year. Um, in terms of how easy it is, it's a science program. Science programs um, will be challenging any science program will be challenging. Um, so if you study hard, if you, you know, you find out how well, like how you study well, um, it's definitely doable. It can be easy if you work for it. And do keep in mind that uh, medical schools are now looking for, they're not looking for um, you know, robots who can have a 98% average, but don't have a bedside manner, don't have people skills, are not flexible, are not easy to talk to. Um, they, they're they looking for team players, people who can think outside the box, people who can be creative. Um, and so that's why they're no longer restricting the applications to people with a science background. 
And uh, it, you know, in order to write the MCAT, of course, you need a bit of science background, but you don't have to have the degree. So that is true. Um, I think your best bet is to look up uh, each medical school that you're interested in and look up the admission requirements because they will be different for each one. Um, our next question, Sophie, is how accessible are professors for questions and office hours? And do extensions exist in university? Um, this again, this is actually highly dependent on the professor themselves. Um, I would say that professors are generally very, very accessible um, in terms of office hours. They will usually post in your, if you have like a classroom, they will mention what your office, what their office hours are. A lot of professors will also stay after lecture so that you can go and ask them questions. Um, sorry, what was the last part of that question? Uh, do extensions exist in university? Do extensions exist? I have not personally personally asked for an extension. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that they do exist. If you have, again, if you have a serious circumstance, like uh, like a, a death, God forbid, if you have, if there's like a death in the family, a lot of professors will, again, need you to show some sort of proof like Ms. Sagikian said, um, but extensions, they do exist. Also, if you um, require, you know, special, special assistance, like if you, um, like if you, it's the accommodations. same. Yeah, accommodations. Um, then most, if there's like the student, student help center, they will, they can sort of set you up with um, special accommodations and some of those accommodations can allow you to also get um, extensions depending on your need. So uh, yes, they do exist, depends on the circumstance. So I'm just going to add a little bit to that. Uh, I think that if you, so first of all, there is a grade 5%, uh, 10% deduction if you're late. Um, if it's an assignment essay, that kind of a thing. Um, if again, as Sophie mentioned, if there is a serious reason, uh, then you will have to provide documentation. Otherwise, no, they don't really give extensions easily. Again, think about all the, um, the thousands of students that go and they can't just easily hand out extensions. Again, it's not like high school. It's gonna be very, very different. Uh, a note here, we're always saying in the guidance department that uh, if you have an IEP, uh, if you do require special accommodations, remember, they're not going to know this about you because it doesn't go in with your application. So you really need to advocate for yourself. You need to show documentation that says, I have such and such, and I need, you know, the use of a computer. I need the use of a quiet space. I need, you know, double the time or whatever it is, but you do have to show documentation. Remember that an IEP is unique to the TDSB only, okay? They cannot see your IEP. They don't know that you have an IEP. Um, so you have to advocate for yourself. And I know students have asked me in the past, parents have also asked me, will this work against us? Do they look unfavorably upon us? If I have a learning disability, if I have you know special needs, absolutely not. Um, the university, the universities are equal opportunity places for learning, and it's just merely to provide you with the accommodation. So it is in your benefit to advocate for yourself, to go to the student services department and say, hi, this is me, this is my documentation, and ask for the accommodations that you need. Yeah, yeah. and to, to echo on that, it's, that is, it's, True, 100%. That's the word that I was missing, IEP. I forgot what the name of it was. Um, yes, those IEP-like things exist in university. They, again, won't transfer over. Um, I have a friend, actually, that uh, currently has an IEP equivalent um, thing here at McMaster where she um, has to take uh, medication for insomnia and this medication causes her to be really, really drowsy in the mornings. So she was able to get accommodations for herself that if she if she had to write a midterm in the morning, that like if she was if there was this midterm scheduled in the morning, that she would be able to write it at a later time or at a later date. Um, so, yeah, there is support. You just have to show the proper documentation.
Okay, wonderful. And just two last class, um, two last questions. It says you mentioned to study in the afternoon. Don't we have TA classes in the afternoons? Usually, how many days of the week do we have classes? Um, TA classes in the afternoons. That is highly specific to your course schedule. Um, I did not have TA classes in the afternoons. So again, highly dependent. Usually how many days of the week do you have classes? Again, highly dependent to your own schedule. I had classes five days a week. Um, there could be days where I only had one class um, on a, just one class. There were some days where I had four. So it, it really, it depends on how you sort of structure your course schedule. And actually another tip about that, don't chunk all of your courses into like two days. One, I don't think that's even possible, but don't chunk them up um, because it's just overload for your brain, especially if you have three hour lectures. I fortunately only had 50 minute lectures, but having four 50 minute lectures in a day can really take a toll on you. So make sure you space it out and mix in breaks on top of that. I think uh, it's important to reiterate that you you're the one that gets to choose your schedule, which is really nice. That's the big difference between high school and university. So you're given the list of courses and you're given some options of when they're offered and you get to sign up for what you want. So, for example, if a course has is two hours worth during the week, you can do two one hour sessions. Or you can do, let's say, one two hour session in the evening from six to eight or it could be Wednesdays and Fridays from nine to 10, let's say as an example. So if you're a morning person, great, nine to 10 sounds good. If you're an evening person, then you would do the six to eight, but it's nice because you get to choose and the TA hours, the TA classes as well, that'll be dependent on the, cl the, the classes that you choose. Yeah. Um, the last question is how do TA classes work? And maybe Sophie, you can explain what TA, TAs are and, and what TA classes are. Okay, so TAs, um, TA stands for a teaching assistant, and these are usually upper year students, masters, PhD students um, that kind of are earning a little bit of extra money on the side by uh, being an assistant teacher to the professor. There's usually several of them per course. Um, they usually help grade um, assignments because, you know, a professor can't grade 700 assignments on their own. Um, TA classes, um, usually, I know at McMaster, we call them tutorials, um, where a TA will either, you know, go through concepts that were taught in lecture, sometimes they would help you prepare for, um, you know, an upcoming midterm or a test. Um, some of them would teach us, uh, like, um, like coming from, you know, my science, some of them would teach us like lab techniques, and they would show us um how to do things in lab a lot of, like all of my labs were guided by TAs so TAs are very much a fundamental part of your course and so it again is highly course specific as to what you will get out of your TA but they will usually they're usually um I would say really utilize your TA because they will most likely they they taught um they've taken your course they will have taken your course. And so they know things like, you know, they can give you test tips. They can give you, you know, study tips as well. Um, and so, yeah, utilize your TAs and they're going to be the ones that teach you added information. Yeah. Okay. All right, Sophie, thank you so much. I could not have a better job done a better job myself. Your information was accurate, relatable, um, and uh, just spot on. And I think you probably helped answer so many questions that our grads have and uh, grad parents have as well. So we really, really thank you for your effort and uh, taking the time to do this for us this evening. And uh, just to let you know that we did record this session and we will be posting it on the Earl Haig guidance website. And we probably will be posting it on our Instagram website as well. And if you don't follow us already, if you can follow Earl Haig Guidance on Instagram, you're going to find that we post a lot of really useful uh, and up-to-date information regarding post-secondary, 
um, summer school, night school, jobs, volunteering, scholarships, all of the above. So, um, so on behalf of Sophie and myself, thank you so much for spending the time with us this evening and have a wonderful Monday evening. Take care. Good night, everybody. Thank you.